Hey. Good hey, good morning. So, thank you for, you know what? I started this summer out talking about how thankful I am for Agape Chicago, and honestly, I'm just so thankful for you. We, I was talking with the elders about how it's just uh, been pretty much the worst summer in the last seven years for rainouts and things like this that we've ever experienced. We've been very blessed, but here we are the week after whatever last week was. We're together, we're celebrating, and uh, we are glad to see you, and I'm glad uh, to be still in the book of Genesis. Uh, we're only going to be in Genesis for two more weeks, and then we're going to start the book of 1 Thessalonians. If that's a book that you don't write, hey, you know, if that's a book you don't know very well, well, guess what? That's a part of the reason we preach to it, so that you'll know it better. And the book of 1 Thessalonians is very different than Genesis because it's a book written after Jesus' life and a book written to people that are trying to understand what in the world is going on with Jesus and his return. We thought he was coming back at a specific time. And 1 and 2 Thessalonians will help us realize what time we're in and also encourage us to be a community that waits together. I want to pray before I begin. It's football season. My adrenaline is like off the roof. I'm so pumped. And as you, as you, my listener, understand, uh, whenever I have an adrenaline spike, there's trouble for you if I don't get it under control. So I, I need God to regulate me right now. Uh, let's pray. Uh, Father, I want to ask, um, it's really easy to do the routine, do the habit, and expect very little out of it, perhaps because little has happened in our estimation in the past. Uh, today, we, we don't ask necessarily for something extraordinary, but we do ask that you would meet us and that we would realize that that is much better than we had hoped for or expected. We pray that um, however it is that you would feed us, whether it's a, a full banquet or just something like a decent breakfast, I pray that this a uh, meal that I prepare today in your scripture would feed and nourish my brothers and sisters here and be encouraging and engaging to all that have shown today. Uh, I pray that your spirit would move and help us in this time. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Uh, one of my earliest memories of enjoying elementary school occurred in the second grade. All of my class was broken up, broken up into different teams and was assigned a particular task. Uh, so we were given the opportunity to run a business, essentially. And my group of four or five people, I can't remember the exact number, uh, was in charge of starting a restaurant. Uh, again, this is second grade. So we were given $50 to do so. And this was, of course, before inflation, but even then, the numbers were significantly decreased so that second graders could enjoy the exercise. So we had to decide where to spend our money. Were we going to spend it on having higher quality food, paying more staff, doing more advertising, and the like? And we had to think through the scenarios and the problems of overspending in one area versus the other. Now, this exercise of managing hypothetical money offered us something key to our development. Becoming mature requires knowing how to take responsibility for the resources that we have. And there's a delight, isn't there, in managing something that we own, whether it's money or space or even the relationships that we enjoy or even the workplace where we go, making sure that it's healthy and good. Now, whether we're dealing with fake money or making decisions that affect people, there can and should be delight in the process of managing what we have to the best of our ever-growing abilities. We should enjoy taking care of things. We feel that when we do a good job, there's a delight in it. But that's not the whole story for how many of us feel about leading things, guiding things, running things, being in charge. You see, today many of us have learned to view leadership, power, authority with a great deal of skepticism. Like we heard two weeks ago, we are living in a time of leadership crisis. But today I would also argue that we are living in a time of followership crisis. 
some of us are as likely to be influenced by a TikTok celebrity as someone near us, someone that's in proximity to our lives. We are deeply suspicious of any type of authority above us, whether it's in government, church, work, and especially anyone that we would follow that could make demands on our lives. Anyone who yields deep power in our lives is met with a greater amount of skepticism than I say would probably have been true 20, 30 years ago, based on my, albeit not scientific, observation. And to be fair, the leadership crisis that I'm talking about makes such distrust understandable, doesn't it? And we are left in this vicious cycle where the blind are following the blind, and they know it, but they don't know who can see. To put a finer point on how all of this talk relates to my sermon today, we live in a time where things, where life needs to be ruled, led, or directed better than it is, but we aren't really sure who to follow and who is worthy of the trust that we would require to follow them. Since leaders are untrustworthy and followers don't know who they're following, Many capable and sincere folks who could lead and guide something well don't use their power, their authority, or their skills for good. And I want to call us to something different today. Now today's sermon paves the way forward for us in both our leading and our following because we're all in different venues of our life leading in some ways in different areas of our life following. Right now you're following what I'm saying to the best of your ability and I'm leading in this situation but when it comes to food time I'm following the people that are heading the food. You, you get how that works. So today my sermon will have two claims. Ruling well benefits everyone. Ruling well benefits everyone and ruling well reflects the truth. And all of that points to my main idea, which is this. Believe that ruling God's world well is essential to flourishing and honoring the Lord. Believe that ruling God's world is essential to flourishing and honoring the Lord. I want you to see those things. It's, it's not an option not to rule, not to lead. To get rid of authority isn't really what we ought to be doing. And I, I want to help you see that it relates not only to flourishing, doing well in life, but also to reflecting the truth about God. First, ruling well benefits everyone. Ruling well benefits everyone. Today I want to show you that this guy Joseph, who we've been following for some time, when he rules well, it blesses many in the world around him. And this gives us a picture of the life Genesis has envisioned from the beginning for how we are to exercise, exercise authority for the good of others. Now, to fully appreciate Joseph's blessings to many around him, we've got to start and really make sure we get the beginning of our passage straight in Genesis 47, 13. It says this, There was no food, however, in the whole region because the famine was severe. Both Egypt and Canaan wasted away because... Of the famine. I want to ask you some questions just to make sure you understood the passage. How much food is there? None. 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 What's happening to the people? They are wasting away. Being... They are wasting away. They are wasting away. There's no food and they are being described as wasting away. Let us grasp the severity of the situation. This isn't an instance where the writer is using symbolic or hyperbolic language to drive home a point. No, people are on the verge of starvation. And if we saw them today, we would want them to immediately go to an emergency room. Exactly. In the 1990s, certain humanitarian organizations would raise money to help people in foreign countries by doing these commercials. And in the commercials, they would show you image after image of an emaciated, hungry person that was startlingly, that was incredibly skinny in that moment. And then at the end of the commercial, they would encourage you to donate. And many of you immediately, when I mention this commercials to you, have an image of your mind. I haven't seen them around as much recently, but then again, who watches the same TV anymore? 
And those images, some of us associate with dire poverty, with the worst situations, would have been everywhere present around Joseph and his situation in Egypt and even back in Canaan, as we will see. In fact, Genesis 47, 13 through 15, mentions the land of Canaan three times to drive home the point that if Joseph's brothers were still back in the land of Canaan, they would have been in a place with incredible destitution. They would have been starving and had no access to the food that he was able to readily give them in Egypt. And so we see today that when people, are, when the, not only his brothers are blessed, but also in the way that Joseph leads, he helps the people that are hungry out and also helps Pharaoh, his boss, become incredibly wealthy and great. And just as a recap, for those of you that haven't been here through our entire study in Genesis, Joseph is the guy who famously foretold what was going to happen to Egypt by correctly interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. Even while a prisoner, he was called to Pharaoh to tell him what of these images, what of these visions of skinny cows eating fat cows and terrible grain eating healthy grain mean. And it meant there were going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And Joseph, yes, the one who was betrayed by his family and who was a former slave, has because he interpreted the dream well and told Pharaoh what to do, become number two in Egypt. And so he's working now. We're back in the situation where it explains basically in a, in a condensed fashion what happens in the middle of those seven years. And let me drive home again the situation in Genesis 47:15. When the money of the people of Egypt and Canaan was gone, all Egypt came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? Our money is all gone. So even after Joseph has sold them grain in one year, people have run out of cash. They don't have any other means by which to get food. And let me reiterate the point. They're basically all out of goods. There's little they have to offer. And a nation of people will die without intervention. Now this is an unimaginable burden. And I want to make sure that you understand at this point, I'm driving this home because it's going to be really easy for you to see all that Joseph does and interpose your ideas of what's fair and right onto the situation. And I want to drive that away from you if I can. You see, the best aid in this situation would ensure that everyone gets a fair deal and that everyone isn't in a worse off situation next year than they are currently. So Joseph offers them more grain in exchange for livestock. And they bring the horses, their cows, their sheep, their goats. And we are told that Joseph helped them navigate that next difficult year by taking all of their best possessions, by taking and having them sell all their best possessions in exchange for grain. Now you say, man, you're taking away their cows, their sheep. But remember, they're still alive. They were going to die without this exchange. So the people in our situation. They need the next year to go well since so far we're, we're out of cash and we're out of our animals. But next year doesn't go well, does it? So they offer to Joseph and Pharaoh themselves and their lands. And in fact, they even use the word bondage to describe the way that they're going to offer themselves to Egypt. And what this means is stressed in Genesis 47, 20 through 21. 47, 20 through 21. Joseph bought all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians, one and all, sold their fields because the famine was too severe for them. The land became Pharaoh's, and Joseph reduced the people to servitude from one end of Egypt to another. And the word servitude conveys the idea that bondage is intended to uh, describe. Pharaoh owns the land, but Joseph enables the people to enjoy the produce of the land, but with a tax. And in Genesis 47, 23 through 24, we're informed that that policy uh, ensures that these people are saved during this situation. Uh, we are also told that uh, Joseph makes sure that they get seeds to take care of the land and actually grow more fruit on it. And this reflects Joseph's incredible leadership and insight, doesn't it? I mean, if you're going to have famine over seven years, what's the use of planting seeds into the ground? What should you do with the seeds? Well, you should save them until, until the ground is ready for them. And again, Joseph 
tells them to use the seed to gain food for themselves and give, in a way that's fair, a 20% tax of the bounty to Egypt until the time of famine comes to an end. Now again, before you feel like this is highway robbery on Joseph's behalf, I want you to see that and know that people in that day were often taxed at least at 30% when they were producing grain or produce on someone else's land. Uh, and to relate it to our day, this tax is more like a business tax than a consumption tax. Uh, I know you pay 10% in Chicago when you go buy goods. Think about this more as a business tax, and that will maybe help you understand what's taking place. One thing we do see, and I want to make sure I acknowledge, is that however powerful and rich Pharaoh was before the famine, he becomes so much wealthier at the end of it. All of Egypt, all of Egypt is now under Pharaoh. He owns all of it. And to be sure, if you think that Joseph is running Pharaoh's massive exploitation machine, I want to make sure, don't forget the desperation the people are in so that you don't ignore how the people felt about their situation. How do the people feel about their situation after all you say, Pastor? Well, let's look at Genesis 47, 25. This is what they say about themselves. You have saved our lives, they said. May we find favor in the eyes of our Lord. We will be in bondage to Pharaoh. Again, I, I know there's a cringe effect that you're probably feeling right now, but let them just tell you how they feel about everything that's happened. They're glad for their situation and glad to have Pharaoh and Joseph rule over them. Don't forget, in their poverty, they couldn't run home to Mama and Papa and ask for some more cash. There wouldn't be a credit card in place for them to charge more and gain more debt. And there wasn't a massive system in place for those that were in poverty to have their needs cared for. There was nothing. They had no hope without Joseph. Joseph saved their lives. He saved the world around them. And when these people sold all they had, the closest approximation we have to their ongoing lives is what we would call sharecropping, or even for those of you that know uh, your, your last thousand years of history, is the feudal system in Europe where the land didn't belong to the people, but they often got to rent it and work it and get a, a produce from it. They got to keep 80% 80 of the proceeds of the grain. And what that means for the future possibility of growing wealth and you know rising up in society, the passage isn't really that concerned about telling you that. That's not the point of today's scripture. What it wants you to see is that Joseph saves the day. His family's in a better place because they're not in Canaan starving. Pharaoh's in a better place. He saved the people. Everyone has benefited from Joseph's rule and contrary to how we might be tempted to read the passage. Now, you might, you might think I'm just being a little too hard on you folks who are reading it in a certain way. And to be fair, I wanted to let you know, I actually changed my sermon after going through about a page when I realized what was taking place. I initially wondered if Genesis was trying to help us see the flip side of God's providence in this story. You see, Joseph is establishing Pharaoh. And why does that matter for those of you that know your uh, Bible well and what happens in Exodus? Well, Pharaoh's successors will eventually enslave Joseph's family and their descendants. The original audience certainly would have had that in the back of their mind. However, the clear takeaway in this original passage, in this passage here in Genesis 47, is that we are to see that when people trust Joseph's leadership, they receive the blessings that come from putting a man who is following God in charge. And the people are helped just like Pharaoh are. I encourage you to see the benefits that Joseph offers in light of Genesis 1, 26-28 when humanity was called by God to rule over the earth in reflection of how God rules all over the universe. When humans that are gifted both in terms of ability and opportunity lead their scope of influence well, whatever that is, it blesses others. When you take care of your stuff, other people benefit. It's just how things work, and it will always work like that. Though we might read the story through our concerns about systemic exploitation, there are many key differences between Joseph's and ours, and so I am really guarding against you imposing your, your concerns on his. 
the most compassionate, responsible, and forward-thinking option is Joseph. And I want you to see that. And I want you to feel that as you read it. I mean, let's do, let's, let's put you back in the shoes of a second grader, shall we? I mean, consider how you would have done things, right, in this situation. How would you have done better? You have been given authority to sell a limited number of resources in the midst of a famine. And you have to do it in a fair way, in a way that ensures everyone pays the same price and that you're, the person in charge doesn't lose all of their possessions. What do you do? Well, you set a fair price. And when everyone has run out of cash, what do you do? You figure out what else you can trade and barter. And when everyone else runs out of all the things to tra trade and barter, you figure out a way to make it work with land and the like. Yes, Pharaoh grew wealthy because he spent seven abundant years acting like he was a miser and a pinch penny. His choice to tighten his belt during that time saved many lives, however. And are we going to be upset that the person who helped everyone survive has a little bit more than I do? Who else would you want in charge but the person who saved the day? I, I know, I know, controversial stuff. Consider Joseph is leading in a, con a catastrophic time. If a leader in our day goes through something significant that they can't control, guess what happens in the United States? They don't get reelected. Ruling well in times of plenty is easy, but ruling well in a time of chaos, which is what we're seeing here, is incredibly difficult. And so when we look at Joseph, we're to see and be inspired by someone who takes care of their stuff well. To be sure, one last thing, Genesis wants you to understand that this situation that was good in famine shouldn't continue forever. Look with me at Genesis 47 through 26. So Joseph established it as a law concerning land in Egypt, talking about that sharecropping situation, which is still in force today that a fifth of the produce belongs to Pharaoh. It was only the land of the priests that did not belong to Pharaoh. And that little parenthesis, that little note there that says still in force today is a subtle suggestion that this is how things ought to have lasted. Joseph did a measure that was important in his time, but it should have been different moving forward. Eventually, Pharaoh does become someone who exploits people and uses them for evil. And the Bible wants us to see that as well. But that wasn't what was happening in that day. You see, just like our Federal Reserve is right now raising interest rates. You've heard about that on the news, right? When cost of goods are up to ensure that we don't buy too much stuff, keeping inflation going up and up and up. So Joseph made the cost of grain costly in his days to make sure people didn't overeat, take all the supply until the time was done. You've got to be moderate in a time of scarcity so that you don't die. And the cherry on top of all that I've been saying so far is that we're told that the priests get to keep the land themselves. Now Joseph married the daughter of an Egyptian priest, and his people, Israel, were supposed to be a nation of priests. And even the Levites later on would be given a specific trust without land to care for the spiritual needs of Israel. And they want us to see that from high to low, from the secular to the spiritual. Every single person in that, land, in that land benefits from Joseph's rule. It wants us to see that when we're in God's world, God is organized in such a way that when Frankie does well, it doesn't mean that Joey has to do poorly. Instead of reading our concerns about the growing disparity in wealth into this passage, which is an important discussion to have, I want us to see and embrace what Genesis is trying to drive home. Wouldn't it be great if people in charge just did the right thing? Wouldn't it be great if people in charge were more concerned about what's right and what's good and what's going to help people than they are about what's easy and expedient for me in this situation? I'm sure there are people that were mad at Joseph and Pharaoh that day about what was going on. But they ruled and they took care of it well. I mean, when I say I'm sure, I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm guessing, but I can imagine Joseph ruled well precisely because he took God's direction from the dreams of Pharaoh and executed a plan based on God's revelation. God was leading Joseph. And because God was leading Joseph, Joseph took control of the situation and ruled things under his purview 
responsibly. And if you think that I'm making a mountain out of a molehill of a passage, I wanted to tell you that even Jesus talked about the importance of ruling well in a situation. He once told a parable later, many years after Joseph, about a wealthy prince that goes to a distant land to ask to become king. And in his absence, he leaves stewards behind to take care of some of his resources and manage it well until he returns. And this prince does, in fact, return a king and asks his servants to say, What did you do with my money while you were away? And those servants who ruled well in that situation, who took care of their responsibility well, were placed over cities. And the one who didn't had what he had taken away. And I want to tell you that to simply suggest to you, to simply claim to you that ruling well even matters to Jesus. In fact, all throughout the story of Scripture, ruling well is tightly connected to what God wants. You see, every one of us, again, leads, rules, guides something. We all have authority in some, in some spheres of our life. Whether it's an apartment, you have authority over that. Are you taking good care of it? A pet, a family, a business. Your competencies and your opportunities will vary, but that you are leading something doesn't. And God's expectation doesn't change. What you've been given, you're called to rule well for the benefit of others. As believers in Christ, we are called not only to rule what we have well to bless others, but as the aforementioned parable suggests, and other places in the New Testament make more explicit, there's a tight connection, and this is the really good part. Oh, goodness. This is the really good part, okay? How we rule today is tightly connected to receiving rule in the next life. How we rule in this life is tightly connected with what's given to us in the next. Now, I don't have time to make a biblical presentation of all the scriptures that make this argument. To make the point simple and to make it clear to you what I mean by the connection between ruling well now and ruling uh, well later, I want you to understand that when Jesus promised that the meek would inherit the earth, What does someone who inherits the earth get? They get to rule over the earth. He was telling the truth. When Jesus was trying to drive home the idea that all that are called to lead like God called Adam and Eve over the earth, God's going to return us to a time in the new heaven and new earth to restore stewardship over God's creation. His his eternal dwelling with us is humanity. God has promised inferentially in many places, like I just mentioned in the New Testament, and explicitly other places, that if you do well today, there's some way that you're going to rule well in the next life. If you're asking me to explain all that to you now, well, you're asking me to imagine what I haven't seen just yet. Some of you might be like, wait a second, I don't, I, leading right now is exhausting, it's tiring. I, you know, I, I want to lead right now, so I'll, I'll be okay, and then in the next life, I just kind of want to chill on the couch. And, and I want to tell you, don't, don't think like that. Don't understand that you have been called and made by God to rule responsibly over the things in life and that God will actually entrust you somehow, some way to rule something in the next life. And don't forget, in the next life, everyone around you won't be sinners any longer. And oh, you'll have a new body that won't grow weary or tired. And the work you're doing, you will always see the point in it because you know it's flowing out of God's call to make and to restore beauty everywhere that hit the curse has been driven away. And again, if some of you are dubious on my claims here, I would love to talk to you about it. Right now, when you rule well, God is preparing you for what's ahead. You are experiencing a dress rehearsal for the real thing one day, and I want you to see that. And may that be motivation enough to undermine your deep suspicion today of power and rule. We need people to rule well. And I want to motivate you also to rule whatever it is that you know that you have well in this time. So let me make a request. I need you guys to rule over something. Is that okay to ask you to rule over something, to put you in charge of a thing? You see, in two weeks we go back inside to the 400 movie theaters until next June. We'll be inside all winter and spring. That means we will need help with slides, sound, and setup. And some of you have already been asked to help with some of those things. And we are asking everyone, everyone who calls this their church, to help out with something. It doesn't even have to be one of those three things. We could offer you more opportunities to help. For some roles, like setup, slides, and sound, that means once a month you show up at 845 to rule what you have well. 
And by doing this, you'll benefit everyone who comes into our, our services on Sunday, and you will defy the old church rule that says that 20% of people do 80% of the work. That's not how we want it to be at Agape Chicago. That's not how it ought to be. And when 20% of the, 20% of the people do 80% of the work, guess what happens? That 20% gets tired. But when we all are pitching in and helping out, everyone gets blessed. So I'm asking you to help out with that. And when we give you a, a rule over slides, put you in charge of slides or sound or stuff or anything like that, we're asking you, under God's authority, to rule that thing well for the good of others. That's the point I want to drive home. The second truth is much shorter because it's based on a shorter path, part of my passage, which I had to find again. The second thing I want to drive home is that ruling well reflects the truth. Ruling well reflects the truth. Now, I've already mentioned how Canaan is emphasized three times at the beginning of our passage to remind us how Joseph's family would have been suffering back home without him. And our passage takes us to a brief conversation between Joseph's father, Jacob, and himself. Now, Jacob has been in Egypt for 17 years at this point. He's 147 years old at the time. And he knows his days are running short. So he calls Joseph in for a final request. And this is what he says. He says this in Genesis 47, 29 31. When the time drew near for Israel to die, he called for his son Joseph and said to him, if, you have, if I have found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh and promise that you will show me kindness and faithfulness. Do not bury me in Egypt. But when I rest with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt and bury me where they are buried. I will do as you say, he said. Swear to me, he said. Then Joseph swore to him, and Israel worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Now, I think it's funny that after asking Joseph to do this, uh, Jacob made him swear uh, to drive on the point, no, I really need you to make sure this gets done, that I get buried back in the land of my fathers. But what I really want to highlight is the fact that Jacob has 12 sons. But he chose Joseph to make this promise. And jo why? Because Joseph is the one that he trusts the most. And for good reason. Joseph has, in every sphere of his life, proven the most trustworthy. But if you will excuse me for having a little bit of an argument with Jacob in this situation, I want to ask him, Hey man, don't you have 11 other sons? Maybe consider having one of them who's not saving the world do it. I mean, after all, Joseph has basically done everything to ensure the family's safety. He's given them all these possessions. Why are you adding one more thing to the dude who's doing everything? I mean, couldn't Joseph just say, kind of busy, you know? I've got a lot of work to do. Could someone else do it? Or maybe, hey, you know, Benjamin, the youngest brother who I gave so much stuff to, you know, can, he's got, he's, he's your other favorite. <laughs> Instead, Joseph is the one that's asked. And he will fulfill his responsibility to rule the matters of family well, just like he takes matters into his own hands over Egypt. And what's my point in all of this? The Joseph that rules over Egypt is the same guy you get at home. The life he lives as son, as dad, is the same as number two in all the land. He rules his life in a way that's consistent, a devotion. Everywhere, everybody gets Joseph 100%. And you say all that's not necessarily in the passage, but what else could it mean? And what I want to also help you understand, and in doing this, and ruling all spheres of his life in a consistent fashion, not only is Joseph fulfilling the Genesis 1.26-28 call to rule over the earth, he's reflecting God's image in a way that he's supposed to. God is the one God who's always the same, never changes, and always rules everything that he owns well. There's nothing that God rules over that he takes breaks on, that he looks at and says, I'm not going to make this exactly how I intend. And so when we rule our various spheres of life the way we ought to, we were reflecting the attributes of God in a pronounced fashion. For just as people bless others by ruling well, all of our blessings that we will receive come true because God rules the world with truth and grace, as the song says. So the world isn't simply blessed materially when Joseph rules well. The world sees the truth about God when things are ruled 
as they ought to be. God's image is shown to the world that th- when things are ruled as they ought to be. And our world needs more people that are looking like God in this chaotic, uh, chaotic moment. Let's look at our own city, folks. The city of Chicago is known for many things like architecture, world-class food, excellent arts, and of course the 1990 Chicago Bulls. <laughs> but we are also known for poor governance, for corruption, or ineptitude in our government all the way down to our public services. And at last check, I checked last week, the number of our city's aldermen that are not running for re-election is up to 12. That's uh, out of uh, over 60 of them. And most of them are not running again so that they can face off against the mayor because they are tired of her leadership and they can't work together. And this is but one, one example of the larger leadership problem our very city faces. And as a church, the Bible tells us that we are a city on a hill and that we're to reflect the city, the light of Jesus within our own city. And we do this as a community that has authority in various spheres of our lives. And as we are led by a Savior that died for our sins, we are, we are led by one who is humble, who is able to lead with kindness and compassion. But we also lead after the pattern of one who is risen from the dead. And so we can take all of our efforts now and reflect back the truth of the victory of Christ because we can know that whatever we do and put our hands to, God's going to use it but we can do so in a way that's not concerned about our egos or anything else. So if we're going to invite Chicago to feast on the love of Jesus, we must show the rule of God well in the way that we rule our own lives in consistent fashion in a way that blesses others in all that we do. We can show the world that we all need someone to rule over us. When we experience good rule, good leadership, we believe that a God who rules over all things is worth trusting. And isn't that what we want, dear dear friends and family? Let's pray. Uh, God, I want to thank you again. You, I, I, I say I want to thank you because that's what I want to do. I want to celebrate you, God. I want to acknowledge that you have called us not simply to exist for about 76 to 77 years, depending on whether we're male or female, and then die. But you've called us to take responsibility over something, to rule your world well, and to think about what it means for others, both in terms of the blessings they receive immediately and the blessings they see in terms of seeing how things ought to be in your world. And I pray I pray that if people are, are here today and convicted that they ought to take more responsibility for what they have in a particular sphere of life, I pray that they would live into that. I pray they wouldn't walk away today, hear something, live. Thank you.